So to give you a bit of background, um, Alcom was formed in 2020. My boss Pratik Tiwari has a lot of experience in the ethanol market and which is why when Alcom was set up, it was set up predominantly as a trading house, as a small trading house to look into biofuel related uh, developments. So it was more along the collection, processing and distribution of biofuels. Um, this is stuff like used cooking oil, palm oil, mill effluent, cashew nut shell liquor, all sorts of agricultural waste products that are eventually refined into fuel that can be put into your cars, your ships, and uh, eventually your airlines too. So this is what Alcom started off with. And in 2021, we made the transition to shift towards more uh, carbon removal aspect of things. Because, I mean, biofuels is in the uh, carbon avoidance space because uh, logically how it works is that you have a biofuel which is displacing fossil fuels, especially in the airline industry, in the maritime industry, as well as in the automotive industry. And eventually we started seeing like a pattern evolve, not just towards uh, carbon avoidance, but also for carbon removal. And we want to get involved in that space. So in 2021, we set up Alcom Carbon Markets. I was hired as well in 2021 to look into Alcom's uh, strategic initiative to focus more towards uh, carbon removals. And that was my role and responsibility. Could we talk about the work your parent company is doing? Specifically, uh, I would like to learn a bit more about biofuels. What Alcom does, we're more involved in the collection, processing and distribution of biofuels. And what we deal with largely is uh, second generation biofuels and beyond. So what second generation biofuels are is um, basically biofuels made from agricultural waste. So like, you know, if you were to use used cooking oil, uh, corn cobs, animal fats, tallows, excess waste from slaughterhouses, stuff like that, and you were eventually to uh, convert it into a biofuel, that would be second generation. Your first generation biofuels are uh, made for purpose feedstock. So for example, converting corn directly, you know, having giant corn fields, which then produce ethanol. That would be your first generation. Your second generation is waste and your third generation is waste of a waste. So that itself becomes a bit trickier, but um, yeah, it is, it is something that you can convert to biofuels. So this is largely, we deal with second generation mainly. And even within that, the main one we deal with is used cooking oil. So we're involved in the collection of used cooking oil. We, you know, pre-treat it and then eventually we process it into Yukomi. So that is basically used cooking oil, methyl ester. And that itself is then blended with fossil fuels. And then it's used in cars, in uh, vessels, etc. And then of course, there are other products we produce. We don't only produce Yukomi, we generally produce uh, methyl esters made from waste material. So the, so the catch-all term is called FAME, fatty acid methyl ester, and that basically means any sort of biofuel that's basically made from waste product. If you upgrade this, you can upgrade this into hydro-treated vegetable oil. Uh, the difference between FAME and hydro-treated vegetable oil is that hydro-treated vegetable oil or HVO is a one-for-one -one replacement. So you can ha technically have a car that can fully run on HVO. Whereas for fame, there's this thing called a blend wall where there's only a certain amount that your engine can take before it starts showing trouble. Usually a lot of countries have like, you know, E5, E10, E15, that basically means ethanol 5%, 10%, 15% that can actually be safely blended uh, and your car can run safely. Anything above that then starts to cause issues. So this is another thing. And the final thing we deal with is sustainable aviation fuel. SAF, that of course is the most premium biofuel of all. Uh, one of the reasons is because of course it's used in airplanes and it needs to be uh, liquid even at up to minus 40 degrees centigrade because uh, yeah, you're all the way up in the stratosphere. When I was doing training course on decarbonization of transport <clears throat> sector, uh, I could see that a lot of people in aviation are talking about, you know, the airplane companies are ready to switch to SAF, but where do you get it? So the biggest problem is the infrastructure and actually lack of production of SAF. So it seems to be quite a growing area and potentially funded by big players in the aviation industry. 
Do you get any funding from uh, aviation companies or pre-orders for SAF? So, I mean, so, so right now we are like in commercial negotiations with companies that are looking to uh, transition towards SAF. But yeah, like you mentioned, it's completely correct. Uh, the biggest constraint right now for SAF production is access to feedstock. Uh, again, the, the issue with biofuels is that you have like this biofuel and it can be used in either, you know, FAME, in HVO or in SAF. The same exact same biofuel can be used in all three categories. So there is a competition from within the industries itself. And of course, the, the, the trickiest thing about especially the aviation and the maritime sectors is that they, they can't be electrified. They can't be electrified. I mean, your long haul trips. And unfortunately for aviation, 95% of their emissions is just fuel oil usage, jet fuel usage. And I presume it's a similar number for the shipping industry as well. So yeah, there, there, there seems to be a bit of a blockade over here. You're, you're eventually going to hit a speed bump. Uh, I mean, which is why, again, like when we're looking at our modeling assumptions, uh, we, we might be able to decarbonize 90%. But 10% will always be uh, reserved for like, you know, the, the, the shipping industry, the aviation industry, uh, heavy industry, all of these industries, which are not only hard to decarbonize, but in a way, they're also like quite unsafe to decarbonize. Like a lot of people won't be comfortable going on a, going on a long haul flight that's just uh, like, you know, that runs on electricity or, or, or a giant ship like, you know, traveling for like 15 to 20 days that that fully runs on electricity. Well, I mean, at the moment it is not possible. Yeah, exactly. At the moment it's not possible. So it's just the way things are, the, the constraints that we're given at the moment. Given that there is this huge demand for biofuels, do you think there are any potential risks affecting our food systems, land use and biodiversity? Because obviously when you don't have enough waste, maybe we will start taking lands for growing feedstock to produce biofuels. And I think it's already happening. Yeah, this is quite a contentious topic. It's always, they call it the food versus fuel debate. This is what's plagued the first generation biofuels. And that's what led to the development of second generation biofuels was that people weren't very happy that uh, you had a lot of indirect, they call it ILUC, indirect land use change associated with converting, let's say, like, you know, barren land or even potentially agricultural land uh, and redirect that away from food production and prioritize fuel production over it. That is a big issue. A lot of fame that's produced is also from, like, you know, uh, vegetable oils, which would technically be qualified as a first generation biofuel. It's not like an uh, advanced biofuel in that point of view. What I would say is that there is push towards it, but... Currently, I'm not exactly very happy with the way things are being done. I understand that people have their own concerns around auditing and verifying certain types of biofuels. But there are, I think, for example, the most common is palm oil. Uh, while obviously it's frowned upon, it's associated with like, you know, uh, cutting down palm trees and like, you know, eradicating uh, orangutans. Uh, the waste product in and of itself from palm oil is actually one of the easiest to convert into a biofuel uh, in terms of the yield is the highest which is why what ends up happening is that let's say you completely exclude this category then there is anyways not enough biofuel to go around and you're again slowly removing certain types of feedstocks off your list like okay we won't qualify this again a decision has to be made in terms of how to sustainably manage it how to qualify and quantify it but from, from my perspective, we need to be inclusive of as many second generation biofuels as possible. And if we actually want to hit uh, net zero. Um, you mentioned that the uh, market of biofuels is quite developed. Who are the major market players and w what are the biggest developments on uh, biofuel markets? So, I mean, the biofuels market, you obviously have your oil majors. They are heavily involved. Like, you know, your, your Shells, Exxon, Total, all of these uh, big players are heavily involved in uh, utilizing biofuels, processing it. You have one of the largest renewable, I mean, solely focused on biofuels, that's Neste. They are basically leading the show in, uh, as a company that only focuses on biofuels. You, you, then you have like certain smaller companies that are just involved in collection, like, you know, local, regional collection of 
biofuels and then they are involved in like you know further processing you have a lot of chinese producers as well and because they have access to china's huge used cooking oil market yeah apart from that uh, then there is the entire us ecosystem which is slightly different from the european ecosystem mainly because of the international requirements so to be qualified to sell biofuels in europe you do need like iscc certification uh, that is like you know the europe standard us has their own epa uh, certified biofuels that can enter that market so you ha- so you have so this so is it assessing quality and sustainability of the product or yeah yeah it's it's basically meeting their requirements e- e- each each of these systems have their own uh, pathways that determine like you know how many credits will you get what pr- what price of the credit you'll get for engaging in this activity for selling biofuels what qualifies what feedstocks qualify what feedstocks don't so the so the EPA and the ISCC have their own uh, separate systems by and large this is how it works